Hi, this is John Potter and welcome to session three of Leadership in Action. In this session, we're going to have a look at the behavioural approach to leadership. We're now going to have a look at the behavioural approaches to leadership. And of course, this behavioural approach was really paralleling what was happening in psychology in the 20th century, where the shift was happening from psychology being really a more of a philosophical approach to the human condition towards a scientific or behavioural science approach. So, let's now have a look at slide two. So, looking at slide two, we start this particular session looking at leadership, the behavioural approach, considering the work of Ralph Stockdill, who was really a very much a pioneer on the scientific approaches to leadership. And he suggested that there were some specific leadership characteristics, initiation, membership, integration, organisation, domination, communication, recognition and production. And that's quite an interesting start to this business of trying to understand the characteristics of a leader. Now, Ralph Stogdill's already been mentioned in a previous session, and his work, including the production of his Handbook of Leadership in 1974, was one of the first really scientific approaches to understanding more about leader behaviour. And he proposed a number of characteristics which we see in the slide. He also examined the subject of defining leadership using the above as reference points for types of definition and his first attempts at collating definitions of leadership resulted in well over 160 definitions and apparently in the later version of his book this has expanded to over 200 definitions. So as with all lists of attributes and characteristics two problems present themselves. Firstly, does this list accurately represent the complete situation? And secondly, to what extent are these characteristics situational and dependent on the context? We all know that we behave differently in certain situations. We shine in some situations. We sometimes don't handle other situations very, very well. Well, both questions are very, very difficult to answer. And, however, the next slide, which we'll be shortly moving on to, shows how this approach moved forwards the science of understanding of the nature of leadership. But before moving on to the next slide, please give some thought to the following study question. To what extent do you feel that Stockdale's leadership characteristics paint an accurate picture of what leaders actually do and the responsibilities placed upon them. So, let's delve into Ralph Stockdill's work in a little bit more detail, looking at the work of Ohio State University. As Stockdill's characteristics were reduced by a process, similar in many ways to factor analysis, to really try and drill down to create the four key aspects of leadership. And these four key aspects were consideration for people, sensitivity to people and people issues, production emphasis, and what we would call initiating structure. And these, of course, may be further reduced to two key umbrella areas, issues related to supporting the followers, that's the consideration and sensitivity issues, and then issues related to addressing the task, that is production emphasis and initiating structure. Well, Stockdale's work on leadership characteristics was the main input for research to investigate leader behaviour clusters, and his set of characteristics, as we've said, was reduced by a process akin to factor analysis, which came up with these four characteristics, consideration, sensitivity, production emphasis, and initiating structure. And these, in turn, were reduced to the two areas of relationship behaviour and task behaviour, mirroring, really, the work of Stogdill and the work of Mouton and Blake, and other people who were looking at leader behaviours. Now, this idea of identifying relationship and task behaviours led to a creation of a number of leadership assessment and description tools, including cart sorts and behaviour incidents rating tools. Two sets of behaviours were included in the tests, one for task behaviours and one for relationship behaviours, and individuals were asked to rate how often the leader carried out each behaviour. And this enabled 
differences in perception to be identified between the leader's perception of their own behavior and the perceptions held by those being led. And in some respects, this is very much an early version of what we could call 360 degree assessment or appraisal. With the onset of sophisticated computing power, particularly in the uh, 1970s and 80s, it then became possible to create subdivisions within each behavior set and identify mathematical structures within the data when it was examined, because now we could handle data matrices for, say, 150 subjects across maybe a data set of 40 or 50 task or relationship behavior variables. So the concept of task and relationship behavior was created following on from some of the investigation into group work and uh, this had identified the socio-emotional leader and the task leader roles within a group particularly if you want a group to work effectively someone has to consider the people issues someone has to consider the task issues so before we move on to the next slide just consider the study question do you think that the four Ohio leadership aspects of consideration sensitivity production emphasis and initiating structure do you think they create an accurate perspective of the issues that leaders have to address just give some thought to that before we move on to the next slide Ralph Stogdill was not the only person looking at the scientific approach to leadership and in slide 4 we bring up the idea that the work of the University of Michigan was actually quite significant and in parallel with the work at the University of Ohio, Michigan State University was also involved in investigations into areas of leader behavior. And the four areas that they worked on were the areas of support, goal emphasis, interaction facilitation, and work facilitation. And as with the Ohio work, these were reduced to relationship and task behavior. And a third institution, which we're not going to discuss in detail, um, is the University of Texas. And if you're interested in following up these scientific approaches of the 60s and 70s, then Richard Duft's book, Leadership, uh, gives a very good comparative account of the work being carried out. So let's return to the slide. One of the other institutions then that was contracted by the US Department of Defense to investigate leadership behavior in order to improve leadership selection and leader behavior was the University of Michigan and this study considered leadership behavior in these four clusters of support goal emphasis interaction facilitation and work facilitation and as with Ohio a similar picture emerged on reducing these four areas to two clearly defined areas of relationship behavior and task behavior. So before moving on to the next slide, please give some thought to the following study question. Do you feel that the Michigan studies which had these four basic areas reduced again to relationship and task, do you think those four areas of support, goal emphasis, interaction and work facilitation are as useful as those identified in the Ohio study or do you think they're perhaps less useful. So moving on now to slide 5 this idea of task behavior and relationship behavior started to generate a number of interesting developmental models for leadership ability and in particular it triggered the Moot and Blake managerial grid approach although perhaps today we might call it the Moot and Blake leadership grid and this was a key development which emerged from both the Ohio and Michigan studies together with the work at the University of Texas and two axes of leadership behavior were created leading to five leadership styles that is the styles at the four corners plus a style in the middle of the uh, of the graph as we'll see later now flexibility is characterized by using the central style of moderate task and moderate relationship behavior and then the leader can move to the outer edges so the work of Mouton and Blake then provided a very useful model linking relationship and task behavior and it's very beneficial in making leaders aware of how they tended to behave and then developing an awareness of a range of leadership styles suitable for different situations now the five styles that emerged were as follows 
what was called the high relationship, low task style. This is sometimes called the one nine leadership or people centered leadership style. Sometimes it has the label country club leadership in that it focuses on maintaining good relationships at all cost, even if the task suffers as a consequence. High relationship, high task leadership is sometimes called 9-9 leadership or enthusiast leadership, where the leader energetically displays both relationship and task behavior. Low relationship, high task, sometimes called 9-1 or task-centered leadership, or sometimes people actually call it Attila the Hun leadership. This is where the leader focuses on the task even at the expense of the relationships involved. And then low relationship, low task, sometimes called 1-1 one, one, or departure lounge leadership. This is where there's little display of either relationship behavior or task behavior. So Mooton Blake's argument centered on the idea of 5-5 five, five, or balanced leadership, where the leader displays moderate task behavior and moderate relationship behavior so that they can make shifts towards the appropriate corner as the situation requires. An example of this might be handling a crisis where a task orientated behavior is often appropriate in the first instance when first handling the crisis and then returning to a more balanced approach when the crisis is over. So before moving on to the next slide, consider the following study question. Which of the Moot and Blake's five styles would represent your behavioral tendency as a leader? Which of those five styles would you say describes you? Moving on to slide six, we can see the Moot and Blake grid in a graphical form. We can see high relationship, low task at the top left, high relationship, high task at the top right, low relationship, low task at the bottom left, and low relationship, high task at the bottom right. So in the same order, we can talk about high relationship, low task as country club leadership, high relationship, high task as enthusiastic leadership, low relationship, low task as departure lounge leadership, low relationship, high task as rather rudely Attila the Hun leadership. And then somewhere in the middle is this balanced approach of medium relationship, medium task focus. And the ease of moving from the central position to any of the four corners is clearly apparent from this particular picture. If you were in a low relationship, low task mode most of the time, and you had to move to a high relationship, high task, that is much more of a style shift than simply going from the medium position in the middle out to the appropriate corner. So, thinking about yourself again and the situations you've been involved with, let's have a look at the study question. Give some thought to this study question. Can you identify a situation for each of the five styles for which that style would be most appropriate? If it's a situation you've been in, that's all the better. If not, you can construct the sort of situation that might be best handled by each of the five styles. Now another example of the Moot and Blake grid developing into another leadership model is the Hersey Blanchard life cycle approach to leadership. And this is quite a useful approach because it now links the mixture of task and relationship behavior to what the group's level of maturity is. Now group maturity is not about the age of the members of the group, it's about how long the group has had an identity of working together and the extent to which it's bonded through common experiences. Now, in many ways, it could be said that the life cycle model of Hersey and Blanchard based on the Moot and Blake grid and takes it to another level. And the easiest way to interpret this model is to imagine a click and drag function with a computer mouse on each of the four corners of the Moot and Blake grid, pulling them into the center and so creating four quadrants in the diagram, each quadrant representing each of the four mixes of task and relationship behavior. And of course, in doing this, we remove the central 5-5 five, five style of the Moot and Blake grid. The relationship behavioral axis is now concerned for people, and the task behavioral axis is now concerned for the task. 
and essentially the idea is that the appropriate mix of leader behaviour is determined by the maturity of the group being led that is how long they have worked effectively and whether they've bonded as a team in terms of performance now with a new team the leader starts off with a high task low relationship behavioural mix that is a directive style to gain respect and credibility then he or she progresses through high relationship high task with a coaching style and as the group develops in both competence and confidence the task behaviours are reduced leaving an emphasis on supportive rather than directive behaviour. And when the group has become an effective, almost self-managing team, the leader then pulls back in terms of displaying either relationship or task behaviour and operates a delegating style. Thus the leadership style progresses anti-clockwise around the curve as the group develops in maturity and effectiveness. Now to diagnose which mixture of behaviours are appropriate for a given group situation, the leader's got to identify this mixture of competence and commitment on the part of group members. And competence and com commitment are basically the two elements of what Hersey and Blanchard call maturity. The directive style tends to work best when the group is new and high in commitment but low in competence. The coaching style tends to be appropriate when the group's got some competence but is perhaps low on commitment. The supporting style seems to work best when the group is high on competence but variable commitment. And then finally the delegating style seems to work best when the group is both high on competence and high on commitment. Richard Duft's book on leadership covers the work of Hersey and Blanchard in some depth on pages 65 and 67. So before moving on to the next slide, just give some thought to these study questions. In which of the four quadrants do you think that your current work group is placed? Is the leadership style being used appropriate for that quadrant? Moving on to slide 8, another approach linked indirectly with task and relationship behaviours is the leader match process proposed by Fred Fiedler in the 1980s. This is linked, as we've said, to task and relationship issues. It has a, an indicator, a measurement tool, a questionnaire which we call the least preferred co-worker scale, the LPC. It really is based on the idea that a leader has deep down beliefs about the importance of task versus the importance of relationships and it looks at the relationship between task orientation and control and relationship orientation and control. This has selection implications and there are quite a few challenges with Fiedler's approach. So this approach then produced by Fiedler in the 1980s falls into the category of a contingency theory. Essentially, Fiedler's argument is that the leader should identify deep down whether they are task orientated or relationship orientated, and this is taken care of using a questionnaire which we've called the least preferred co worker scale, the LPC, which gives an LPC score. Individuals with high LPC scores, according to Fiedler, tend to be relationship orientated deep down within themselves, although on the surface they may well have adapted to display task behaviours. High LPC people tend to perform best in medium control situations, those are situations of medium stress, and poorly in situations of high control and low control. Now one quite challenging part of Fiedler's theory is that there's an inverse relationship between control and stress. High control equates in his model to low stress and low control equates to high stress. We'll talk about control because that's really what Fiedler is wanting the leader to manage. He wants to get them to manage the control they have of the situation. So low LPC leaders tend to perform well in high control situations i.e. low stress and low control situations i.e. high stress poorly in medium control or medium stress situations. The fundamental idea of Fiedler's model is that knowing her or his LPC score the leader can adjust the control in the situation to match what she or he is most suited to handle. The three control variables which Fiedler describes are leader member relations, task structure and position power. 
For example, if a leader is a high LPC person and working in a low control situation, they can adjust the issues in the situation to make that a medium control or medium stress situation by improving leader member relations or relationships, creating more in the way of task structure to reduce ambiguity, and then reinforcing their position power or reaffirming their position power using a variety of means. Now in terms of leadership selection the LPC has a very useful application. If the normal level of control for a leadership or other type of job is medium control for a new individual taking up that post it would be low control due to the newness of the situation. Thus for good short term results an individual with a low LPC would probably perform well with that performance perhaps tailing off as time passes leaving the low LPC person in a medium control situation. For better long term results a high LPC person would probably be more suitable although their performance in the short term would probably not be so effective. Well of course like many models Fiedler's model does have its critics and in particular it's been likened to a skyscraper building constructed on quicksand as no one, not even Fiedler, really understands what the LPC measures. Secondly, the LPC scale can only be applied once as the premise for its validity disappears once the individual understands the Fiedler model. Thirdly, many people comment that their score would depend on the individual they'd selected to rate in the test. However, these criticisms should not overshadow the usefulness of the control issue and matching individuals to the level of control with which they perform best. As such, Fiedler's leader match concept has a real contribution to make in terms of putting leadership into action. Richard Duft's book on leadership covers Fiedler's leadership match concept in some depths on page 60 to 65. So your study question related to Fiedler is this. Do you perform best in high and low control situations or in medium control situations? Please give that question some thought before moving on to the next slide. Now it's worth looking at what behaviours are in terms of a holistic model of the human being. Behaviours do not just happen by accident, particularly leadership behaviours. They tend to occur as the result of belief systems which identify the most suitable behaviours for a given situation. Now an integrated approach to understanding the links between beliefs and behaviours is that of Potter myself, 2003, in my books The Business of Leadership and Intelligent Leadership, which I co-authored with Alan Hooper. It's argued that right at the core of an individual is their identity, which is supported or otherwise by a possible sense of higher purpose. Surrounding this identity level is the set of beliefs and values which, together with the identity level, makes up the individual's self-concept. And the self-concept is the enduring approach they take to life, the universe and themselves. The ability to tap into the power of their self-concept is the next level, which is called capability. And an analogy to this idea is that the engine of a person is their self-concept, and the capability level is the placing of the engine in a drivetrain situation, such as a motor vehicle, a boat, or an aircraft, etc. The state level is analogous to the gear in which the vehicle is placed to deliver hopefully optimum performance resulting in appropriate behavior and an impact on the environment in which the person finds himself. So behaviors and leadership behaviors in particular do not exist in isolation but they are closely linked to belief systems, the belief systems of the leader. So before moving on to the next slide just give the following study questions some thought. What positive beliefs do you have about your ability as a leader which generate useful leadership behaviours? And secondly, what negative beliefs do you have about yourself as a leader which perhaps produce less than useful leadership behaviours? 
In our final slide for this session 3, slide 10, we're going to have a look at leadership behaviours and organisational culture and the link between the two. Firstly, we're going to ask what is organisational culture and we'll look at a number of approaches, the structural, the humanistic approach and Shine's three level approach. In particular though, we're going to have a look at the behavioural approach which really identifies that organisations tend to be encouraged to display certain behaviours on the part of their people. Constructive behaviours, risk avoidance behaviours and internal conflict behaviours. And it's the mix of these behaviours that becomes very, very critical when we start looking really at what the culture of an organisation is all about. So leadership behaviours and organisational culture have a very, very close relationship. One writer, Ed Shine of MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Cambridge, Massachusetts in America uh, in the USA, goes as far as to title some of his books, Organisational Culture and Leadership, in that order to reinforce the importance of organisational culture. And there are many ways that we can view organisational culture. For example, Charles Handy in his book The Gods of Management um, looked at structure and he talked about the structural approach to creating culture. Douglas McGregor was taking a humanistic line when he wrote about Theory X managers believing people needed to be bullied to get them to perform and Theory Y managers believed that all they had to do was train and encourage their people in order to gain good performance levels. Shine's approach is to look at culture on three levels. What you see, then the espoused values of the organisation, what people say is important, and then the third level underpinning everything is the main assumptions regarding what is important in the way the organisation operates. However, it's the behavioural approach to organisational culture that interests us most in this particular session. One approach to culture suggests that the definition of organisational culture is the way things are done around here, namely what sort of behaviours are rewarded. This is the approach of the Synergistics Verex Organisational Culture Inventory, the OCI. You might like to have a Google search on the OCI which will give you a fair amount of information on the tool. And this proposes three clusters of organisational behaviour. Constructive behaviour, risk avoidance behaviour, and internal conflict behaviours. Now although the instrument is aimed at investigating organisational culture it does identify constructive behaviours which a culture should encourage if it is to be effective and successful in the way that it operates. And those behaviours include coaching, an emphasis on cross-functional working, goal setting and the leader becoming approachable in terms of any of their people who may be needing help either with their work or with problems in life generally. As a set of leadership behaviours these four areas are very powerful in terms of shifting an organisational culture from an internally aggressive and risk averse one to one which is constructive in the behaviours that it encourages. So to finish off this session just give some thought to the following study questions. To what extent do you see the four constructive leadership behaviours of coaching, an emphasis on cross-functional working, goal setting and the leader being approachable being used in your organisation? And what steps could you take to promote these behaviours in order to shift the organisational culture to one which is more positive? So give some thought to those questions before just moving on to the final slide. So let's just consider slide 11 for a few moments, the bibliography for session 3, before we finish this session. Firstly, Ralph Stogdill's book on the Handbook of Leadership gives a very good insight into the behavioural approach and an up-to-date review of these approaches of the American universities is covered in a very comprehensive way in Richard Daft's book uh, called Leadership, published in 2008. Warren Bennis, as always, gives a very good insight into leadership and the difference between leadership and management. And then, if you want to probe into the managerial grid, the Robert Blake and Jane Mooton book, The Managerial Grid, published in 85 by Gulf, is a very, very useful one. 
And then the two books which I co-authored, The Business of Leadership and Intelligent Leadership, give fairly up-to-date and fairly concise summaries really of what the behavioural approach to leadership is all about and integrates the behavioural approach into thought on leadership generally. And then finally Edgar Schein's book The Corporate Culture Survival Guide published in 1999 by Jossie Bass gives a very useful practical way that leaders can work towards changing the culture of their organisation from within the organisation from even fairly low levels of management and leadership. So that's the end of session three. Look forward to speaking to you in session four. Thank you.